Welcome to the George Lynch Hunting Podcast, brought to you by Legendary Gear, the game called company that is legend by design. Well, folks, this is part two of our exciting podcast with Ryan Bassham. And um, last week, if you listen to it, the, the stories and hearing the passion of our brothers in other countries and stuff, it is really cool. Here to how the, their style and type of hunting. But we ended up on the on the tail end of that first podcast in the first half. Uh, talking about uh, the things that's happening worldwide, and especially in Australia and, and the liberal and, and the gun controls and stuff that is so real. You know, I always said just because you have an opinion doesn't change it. Something isn't real. And uh, if you ignore it, doesn't mean it's not real. I've always said that about the, the Bible. You know, the Bible has been my roadmap in my life. And uh, people always said, well, I have my opinions. You know, well, I said, you know, God God has facts. You know, your opinion doesn't change God's word. You know, in right. fact, your opinion should be God's word. But anyway, Ryan, I appreciate you coming back for this uh, second half here. And and we, I'd like to finish this up and, and talking about your the Gulliver of Waterfowl. <laughs> and you know what is so cool is that your stories and waterfowl, man, dude, I thought your big game stories, man, like I said, I'm sitting as a kid, remember, and your big game stories, and anybody follows the, 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 your hunts on YouTube and stuff, dude, my, you know, the heart pounding, and you're just like, wow, it's almost like you're right there, and, but I'm telling you what, dude, your, your waterfowl stories are <laughs> right there with your big game, and it's really cool. and, um, we left off, you know, in the first part, talking about, uh, the gun control, you know, and I asked a question about, you know, is it is it the law enforcement, the game conservation, are they as stringent of, you know, watching hunters as they are here in the States? And you led to some good points there, you know, and it's important about our gun permits and, and each area was, it's kind of, uh, what do you want to say? It was, uh, it depended on the region. It was Correct, you know, yeah. Totally Every country and their culture and the history behind how they either, you know, how they apply the law and how they don't, it's, it, it definitely trickles over into uh, the pursuit of hunting without question. And in some cases it's, it's made it much more difficult to hunt. And in other cases, it's a little bit too much of the wild, wild west. But we ended up talking about Australia and some of the, you mm -hmm. know, the, that the antis were able to, you know, put billboards up against hunting you know with everything that's going on in this world whether it's plagues whether it's viruses or you know and the attacks and wars and rumors of wars and everything going on and you know droughts in some of our country and you know people don't they really are they worried about are we harvesting enough food for the world are we harvesting you know and this and that what about poor kids that are being trafficked across borders and you right know, life changing they're worried about you putting a duck in your game bag I mean, these crazy. People, to me, it kind of shows that they are lost with with reality. But the sad thing is, I mean, it's 50-50 that, that you know we're living in a society that that I and I, I don't want to be name calling, so I will call uneducated folks sure. out. There. Yeah, so, no, absolutely. I think that's a good way to put it. I mean, it's it's the world we live in. I mean, I think I saw a statistic too um, a few weeks ago where less than 4% of the U.S. population participates in the pursuit of hunting across all pursuits. I'm talking from dove hunting to, to hunting sheep on top of a mountain and everything in between, less than 4% of the U.S. population. But as a country, we probably hunt more than any other country in the world. So th if you think about that from a world population viewpoint, the percentage of human beings still hunting on this planet is really we're a minority we're it's a very very small demographic um and and that's why we have to be careful we have to be careful in how we vote um who who's in office how we depict ourselves not just on social media but um all the time because it is that fragile and and i think sometimes we we forget that and it's a, it's an important thing to remember and make sure that we are like the cliche, you know, saying, leave it better than you found it. And we have to do that in every sense of the saying. Oh, great, great point. And you mentioned earlier, um, talking about the SCI. Can you mm -hmm. explain quick to our, to our listeners? You know, there's probably not a lot of people. We, we know the NRA, but right. uh, not too many people know SCI. So can you explain? Yeah, that? 
absolutely. So Safari Club International is a um, conservation organization that's been around for, gosh, decades. Um, a lot of people, unfortunately, think of them as just Africa, um, which I totally get. And, and I think when the club originally started, it was probably more uh, centric to hunting pursuits over in Africa, big game specifically. Um, but over time, and especially now, they a lot a lot of their their main office is actually in Washington D.C. and that's by design. Um, that way, some of the head executives at SCI they go and lobby on Capitol Hill on on a monthly basis um, and fight for the rights of hunters and uh, firearm ownership here in the U.S. But a lot of what they do too it, it has ripple effects into um, international places, and so they have you know contingents in, in other areas, other countries. Um, where they're helping fight for hunting rights over there too, because it, it does still affect the U.S. and how we do or don't do things as a country ourselves. And so, um, the best way to think of Safari Club International is it is a conservation organization. But they, uh, the, what I think makes them different than other organizations is they're very much more hands-on on Capitol Hill and lobbying for hunters' rights on a very political level, not just hey, send us our money and we'll throw it towards, you know, this conservation project. It's, um, it's pain to, to help make sure the law falls to our favor and that we don't lose our rights. Wow. It's, I, I have to admit, I always thought it was about African game, you know, big game. Yeah, hunting. most people do. <laughs> people that hunted African, you know, why should I care about that? But sure. it, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this too, like even, on, and a lot of people think, well, well, it's still just big game. It's not guys like, and, and I'll say as an organization, we haven't done a great job. My, my role with SDI is I'm an ambassador. I used to sit on the record book committee for wing shooting of the world. And so I helped with, um, you know, there's, it's a program, the record book committee where you can kind of track what species you've hunted and you can do it for birds too. And so that has been a way, um, to, to raise money. Um, and, but to also keep track of what your goals are as a hunter and what you're doing. And so, um, I sat on that committee and was the committee chair for it, but the wing shooting side of it is just as important. Um, and, and that's kind of my role at SCI is as a volunteer ambassador is to advocate for wing shooting around the world. So what, what can, um, our listeners do to help support that? I think the best thing to do is, I mean, obviously like everybody else now, SCI is on most of your social platforms. It's a fantastic resource. If you go, I think it's, oh gosh, I can't remember their website, but look up their website. If you can go to the Google machine and put in Safari Club International, go to their website, has a tremendous wealth of um, education on what's happening around the world and within the US politically specific to um, our rights as hunters. And so there's a lot of great resources. I use their website a lot as a resource to stay up to date on what's going on in different countries around the world, as well as here in the U S um, regarding our rights as hunters and, and what they're doing as an organization to, to fight for those rights. Um, you can become a, a member. I think it's like, I want to say it's like a hundred dollars a year, or you can do a lifetime membership for a thousand dollars, which is pretty comparable to most other organizations that are uh, conservation organizations. Um, and obviously those dollars help as well. And so um, that's the best way to support. But I think staying up to date and educated on what's going on within the political realm, um, go to the website, stay informed, vote accordingly. I think that right there is the most important thing that you, you know, talking about that folks is that, that you know, ignorance is not an excuse when we lose something. It, it will not be excuses. And it's about being responsible. We all are adults. We're all to be responsible. We're all, you know, God has made us to be in his image. We are to work and be perfect as we can, but we we're also to be protectors, you know, um, uh, I think we called the, you know, if you read in, in uh, Ezekiel, which he talks about being the watchman and, you know, it, that's one thing that I've always in my men's retreats, we talked about, you know, that trying to raise up a new level of, of godly men. And, and it's one thing is about being focused and being focused on your goal. So if you're filled with the word of God and, and understand that, you know, you can spot the enemy, you can spot sin a mile away before it gets here. And I think that's the same th way when we're looking at, 
you know, gun gun rights and hunting is, you know, our God given rights. Not our, it's not a, uh, a a right that we have by, without that. It's our God given right. And people were hunting back. It's as it's as old as farming. People were right. hunting to gather food way be probably way before people were farming. You know, mm-hmm. that way. So that it's always been a way of life. But to understand with anybody who watches the news and if you educate yourself. And again, you know, I've, I've talked and I try to talk to so many of the young guys out there because once we're gone and people who don't preach it, there's nobody else. You know, well, I I hear the comment. I love watching sporting events because I like to see men's accomplishments. I don't like watching the news and hear men's uh, failures. Well, I I can understand that, but it's a kind of a cop out in the same way. And that we owe it to our children and the children after them to try to to maintain and protect the, this God given right that we've been blessed. Our forefathers were, you know, who started my great granddad, my great on down the line, who've been able to enjoy this. And in my age, I've seen things changing, you know, and in, in availability of land and and, and and different things like that. That is trying to make it harder and harder for our young kids to go out so i man i'm telling you it's education is the best tool that we can have besides prayer but i mean go out there this sci you need to go on there folks and and start you know and and check out who what your state representatives and those who are supposedly representing in your state see what they stand for see what they're you know who's behind promoting them who's the money behind them there's an old saying that i could always i used to say all the time you know it's if you got to question something, follow the money trail. It'll exactly. lead you. It'll lead you to who's in charge. And um, so I don't want to get any much further in that because I'm <laughs> really excited about hearing uh, some more of your your travels and stuff. So sure. you got you got your 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 show and your podcast, The Road to One Hundred. And so you said you're at around seventy some and birds right now. Personally, well, so when the idea was born, I was at seventy six. Personally, I'm at eighty one. But um, for the project, and that's kind of where that's pro- that's what we're promoting. Like, I don't talk where I'm at personally a whole lot through throughout the project. Um, to date, uh, at the time of the recording of this this podcast, um, for the road to 100, I'm at 18 species, and Kayam's at 16. And so we're both kind of collecting as we go. Um, it's a little bit different because he is the cameraman, but we take turns like. I'll hold the camera so he can shoot and get his birds too, which is different. So you're getting to see a little bit different interaction. Um, it's not just me. It's we're usually there with other friends or guests or whatever. And then Kyam's getting to shoot and participate as well, even though he is director, producer, you know, wizard, editor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so for season one so far, we're at 18 and 16. But here in a few days, we leave from Mexico. I expect we'll pick up another five, six species while we're there. So we'll end season one with 10 full episodes um, and hopefully around 23, 25 species. So what species are you hunting? Mexico redheads, divers, um, teal? So the thing that's awesome, I've hunted Mexico a lot. Um, I'm fluent in Spanish, so I used to host hunts down there a lot for for waterfowl and big game. Um, It's it's not a scary place, in my opinion. I've been to way scarier places. A lot of people don't go to Mexico because they're fearful of cartel and this and that and the other. But um you know if you don't go to the places the cartel are there's not that much to worry about and most of those places are along the border so um specific to the region we're going to be in we'll be on the pacific side of mexico um about as far south as you can go for waterfowl hunting that i'm aware of in a town or a, a tourist city called mazatlan which is on the beach and so mazatlan your more common species down there great time to hunt is february uh, before they start to reverse migrate but cinnamon teal, blue wing teal, green wing teal, your northern shoveler, northern pintail, um, we'll we'll get lucky maybe on some ruddy ducks, um, Mexican mallards, black belly whistling ducks. Mexican mallards. Those, yes, yeah. What Hot debate that? on. Okay, so this is I like this conversation. So, um, I feel like, and I can't remember. I don't want to get the genus and all that wrong. I'd have to use my cheat notes here. But the mallard. Okay, is probably the most influential single species in the waterfowl world across all continents. Okay, you can hunt mallards almost anywhere in the world. Um, not everywhere, like Australia, you can't, but they're in New Zealand. Um, but we have black ducks, 
in the United States, we have model ducks. Now, there's a big debate on the difference between the Florida model duck versus the Gulf Co or the um, the Gulf model duck that you'd find in Texas, because those are sedent sedentary birds. They don't migrate. So there's argument that we've got the black duck, we've got the model ducks, two species, and then the Mexican mallard, which is more on the Pacific flyway side and doesn't come up north above Arizona. They're primarily just down in Mexico. Now, when you go through and look at all the studies on these birds, they have their own scientific name and they are very different. They don't migrate a whole lot. They are more sedentary in nature. Um, and when you look at the wean speculum, there's very, very big differences. And I, I can't show you with my camera um, on my, my computer, but I've got three of them mounted right here. And so the black duck is darker. It doesn't have any white on the speculum. Um, it's a darker blue, purple, um, and there's zero white. When you get over into the model duck, a little bit lighter brown in color on the body, it's got a little bit of white on the top of the speculum versus the Mexican mallard, even lighter in color as far as the brown body. And it's got a white speculum on the top and the bottom. That So it's it's got a white bar on the bottom and the top of the speculum. And so there's just these little subtle differences and mainly it's geographic, but even in the way the bill color and the speculum are on all three of those birds, even within the model duck, you could argue there's two, um, quite a bit of difference. And when you start going to places like Australia and you see their Pacific, um, Pacific black duck, very comparable to a model duck or, or a, a black duck, as well as the yellow bill duck over in South Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So I like to nerd out on that one. That's a cliff notes version, but um, some, some pretty interesting things. Um, and down in Mexico, the Mexican mallard is definitely one of my favorites. It's not the most colorful bird, like a cinnamon teal or a, fluely, a fully plumed blue wing teal, but uh, they're a heck of a lot of fun to hunt. So the American mallard, I mean, well, the mallards that we're used to in the males, that's the only one that, that it has the green, the male has the green head, correct? Correct. And a lot of what we see in those now, um, you've seen more hybridization of those, which is unfortunate because I hope we don't lose those true American black ducks. But yes, they do have a little bit of green tinge to their head, whereas the model ducks and the Mexican mallards, they do not. That's what my next, you mentioned that, but that's what I was going to ask you if that was the difference between, you know, the Florida and the Gulf of the model duck is what if there was any type of hybrid hybrid what do you call it hybridization hybridization <laughs> yeah, there's a scrabble <laughs> word for you <laughs> yeah say that three times fast but say that uh you know whether well, there's some type of hybrid that have gone in and maybe you know is would that be the difference between the two is just total different um, i think i think with the model ducks specifically it's more that they're sedentary in nature like um, there's different banding programs that have shown us evidence of this. So this isn't just like a guess and a whim. Um, there is banding programs down along the Texas coast for a long time and, and as Florida as well. And what they found through those banding programs on those model ducks is those Gulf Coast um, model ducks from Texas versus the Florida ones, they do not cross over in flyway whatsoever. So they think they are separate. Now, at some point, you know, did, you know, they get blown from one flyway to the other, or did somebody bring them over? Who knows? It's possible. Um, but they're slightly different in coloration. And I think on the Florida one, they, they may migrate up into South Carolina, but that's about it. And they mainly just stay down in, in uh, Florida and the Texas Gulf coast one that, that model duck stays on the coast. It doesn't, I mean, I grew up hunting in Northeast Texas. We never shot model ducks um up above houston ever it doesn't happen they stay on the coast that's it why, why do you think some birds don't migrate ah oh, gosh it's a great question um from a worldwide perspective there are some birds that are nomadic some that are um sedentary like that but it makes more sense based on the the situation those birds are in so like in australia they're nomadic because they're just following wherever the water is period they got to go where the water's at and because of how their dry season is that's why they're nomadic they've adapted in new zealand for example just you know six hour flight away from from australia those birds are um, more sedentary because they're on an island they can't go anywhere like it's, it's really actually kind of small so they're just kind of stuck there um which without going on too big of a tangent your hunting tactics change for these reasons on in areas that's like not, this because they're not that. just yeah it's a totally different thing and then now 
it doesn't make sense though when talking about the model duck in the Gulf Coast of Texas because well, why are they sedentary? I don't know. They just they don't migrate. They're they're there. Well, you know, and and majority of the waterfowl that I hunt in the Midwest, and I would say majority of this country, I mean, our birds migrate is because it's 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 climatic. It's all about the climate right. or no. photo periods. Yeah, exactly. A lot of a lot of species will will migrate just on photo. Like that's why blue winged teal comes down so early. It's not weather. It's still hot. They're migrating on photo periods, but the main targets, mallards and Canada geese, man, we're waiting on that weather. Yeah, kind of same thing as the rod on whitetails. I mean, you know, yeah. if it was cold weather, then the, the deer in Florida and the south wouldn't have a rut. You know, that yep, makes sense. Exactly. So that, exactly. So, man, you, I love hearing this. This is just so much wealth. <laughs> Again, you know, for a guy who just hunts Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it, it is, it's awesome it's freaking awesome so you're looking at you're heading in mexico you're gonna be hunting mm -hmm. your teal and you probably will the redheads be there or they already um so, in I, that part of mexico i don't expect to um we'll get some lesser scop down there too i don't think i mentioned that um, but not as many diver species now further up that coastline i've hunted quite a bit i used to host a lot of hunters down in the obergon mexico area um, that's more like Sia Cortez type of um, part of the, the country. That area holds more redheads for sure. Um, that's also where you're going to get your Pacific Brant. The Brant don't typically migrate much further south of that. And, and what we've been seeing the last several years, call it five or six years now, because we're seeing the eel grass is starting to disappear. We're not seeing the same species of birds as we used to, mainly that Pacific Black Brant. They're not migrating and wintering down there quite like they used to. Um, for redheads, I still think that Texas Gulf Coast, I mean, 80% of your redhead population winters there. That's the place to go. Um, we're going to go explore something new for our project for the road to 100, and we're going to go hunt them out of layout boats up in Ontario on one of the Great Lakes um, and try that because it's a more liberal limit on them there. In Texas, you can shoot two a day. I think in Ontario, it's like five or six a day, and you're doing it out of a layout boat, which I love. And so, um, but it those are kind of hunt. That we Those are kind a, of the two key areas. I come up, you know, I lived in Michigan, but in uh, mm -hmm. on Lake Erie side there, and uh, there used to be a guy named Kalash. He made the Kalash layout boats. He was real pop. But layout hunting is, uh, if you ever done it, it's a humble. It can it's be fun. a humble. Yeah, it can be a humble. <laughs> and it, you improve your your wing shooting, but it is fun, and uh, unless you get seasick and get, you know, but <laughs> it can be work. But it, it's a total different type of hunting yes it is i, th I think that if you like the kind of guy that want to be in, right in the action where they mm -hmm. you're, right, you're right on it i mean they're right on top of the water and they come in dude it's awesome it it's is so awesome we i love it and and this and what's cool about season one for our project so we actually we went we were on two different layout boat hunts we did it um in wisconsin up on lake michigan with uh a father and son duo the ponders mike and grayson ponder and you, if you want to see some cool wing shooting, that kid is unreal. He's a professional sporting clay shooter. He's like 21, 22. Man, he made me feel real bad about myself. <laughs> like That kid is an amazing wing shooter. Amazing. We learned some great stuff from him. Um, so we hunted out of layout boats there. We hunted Old Squaw and Goldeneye. Um, and we got lucky on some scop and a red breast and merganser. And then over on the East Coast, we went to New Jersey with a friend of mine, Michael Braun. I don't know if you know him. He's an amazing decoy carver. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. we hunted out of some layouts over there and um, got on, you know, a bunch of cool species there too. But we also hunted out of a skull boat. Have you ever done that? No, I haven't. What's oh, man. Dude, okay. So I'm not going to do it justice. This episode's probably not going to drop for another month or two because um, it's at the end of season one but a skull boat they use it in the market days and basically it's a, a is that a punt boat it's no it's different it sits even lower to the water literally the what sticks out of the water the most is your belly and so it's it's even more low to the surface of the water um, and basically the whole design is for it to disappear and blend in so you shove weights down into the end of it to put the nose of the boat down into the water further and then there's an oar that goes out the back of the boat and there's like a hand movement that you do like this to make that boat go. And it's basically like a, like a sneak boat, but not in the sense that I think some people, there's a lot of people hear sneak boat and they, they think of this thing that actually it's called a sneak boat, but it's, it's bigger and sits up out of the water. This is different. And it's basically, you are big game hunting, 
truly like you're going in to assassinate a bird. That's you're what it stalk, is. Like a stalk and hunt. It is a stalking game. And so like we, we're out there with binoculars. We're looking for different species. Bam, there's a big raft of birds. Let's get in the skull boat. And we we're in a two-man skull boat. Because Kaim and I don't know how to freaking spell that. work that or um, uh, S C U L L, and it's kind of a lost art, but um, it was so cool. So we, that's how we got our our black ducks and our Atlantic brant when we were over there, and super cool way to hunt. But like we, there were so many different diverse ways we hunted in season one, like classic layout boat, you know, a frame type hunting. We did a a, a timber hunt. We we did layout boat hunting, skull boats. We're going to go jump in air boats and down to Mexico and do it that way. Like the differentiation of the types of ways you can still hunt waterfowl is pretty cool. And I think the species are awesome and that's why it's the road to 100. But the the differences in how everybody hunts these birds is what's going to be really cool to show too. So I'm excited about that. I mean, this is awesome. Yeah, folks, and that's what's so cool about this. You're like the Fred Bear of waterfowling. I mean, you're getting great. <laughs> I mean, you don't see that. You remember? Yeah, you're probably too young. But uh, when I was a kid, man, there was a, another thing. This was, you know, it was so family oriented back in the day. And and we had a show. There was a show to come on every Sunday, and we used to sit around the family. And it was called the American Sportsman, and Kurt Gowdy yeah. was the narrator. And dude, that was. I mean, you'd have celebrities from William Shatner hunting a grizzly with a recurve, and you know. But there were so many cool. And man, and I, I miss that show, and, and because that's how we got to travel and see things like that. And of course, today you got the internet, but the quality of, of everything there isn't that right personality who's going and doing it. And dude, you're you're in <laughs> like that. Well, Your detail. Hope, it's a collective effort, and hopefully, everybody that's been involved. Hopefully, we can because that's what I mean. I look at it as we're Kaim and I are investigative journalists, is the way I look at it. Like yeah. we're we're able to find these really cool things that these amazing people do in our world of waterfowling and and tell people about it and, and show them that and and the species they hunt and how and why they hunt them the way they do. And just as passionate as a guy is about hunting mallards down in a timber hole in Arkansas, and these guys on the East Coast that are still hunting some of these traditional methods, they're just as passionate about as what they do for those species that some people are like, oh, that's a trash duck, which I believe there's no such thing. Um I think I it's just really cool to share I that. One hundred percent on that. There's no such thing. No, not at all. They're all special in their own way, especially when you got them in your hand, and it's like, wow, this is really cool. And now I will argue that some are better to eat than others. <laughs> but um, well, it depends so, on how hungry you are. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You talk about getting creative on your recipes, or just you know having a good sausage recipe mix that you like to do. <laughs> wow. So. Um, I've always wondered uh, it, 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 every so basically every country out there has waterfowl to hunt it, or am I am not correct? Um, I would say if I'm not mistaken, there's 197 countries in the world or something insane like that. Um, I would say every continent absolutely has some sort of waterfowl species on it. Um, hunt, huntable legal species is the trick because obviously like, in China, there's some amazing species, but they're not legal. You can't go over there and legally hunt them. And there's some, there's quite a few countries like that. Um, there's probably more countries where you're not allowed to hunt waterfowl, even though they have them, than where you can legally go. And it's kind of hard to know. I mean, I feel like I, I know a little bit, but we've got like spreadsheets built out on where we're going, why, what the species target list is, et cetera, et cetera, for the next five years. Um but I guarantee you, once we get through that list, there's going to be some places where I'm like, I want to go back to this. I want to go to this country because I haven't been to that country. I've shot those species, but I want to go to that country and see that culture and experience it in that way. And it'll be very much more primitive than what we're trying to do for you know, our filming purposes. Absolutely. I never thought about China. China doesn't allow any hunting, do they? Mm -mm, unfortunately. And they, I mean, gosh, the hunting opportunity there is is amazing. Yeah, it's not allowed. Oh man, I always wanted a stuffed panda. <laughs> <laughs> you know that would get interesting. <laughs> you talk about pissing off some anti hunters. Oh my <laughs> gosh, that'd be, that'd be worse than Cecil. You'd be oh, the worst. <laughs> way worse. I'm pretty sure somebody would try to figure out where you live. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it, it was cool that you're talking about some of these remote places. I do remember seeing Shockey when and uh, mm. on Charlie 
in one of his shows there. But love were, that that Uncharted series was still to date still probably one of my favorite hunting shows ever. Very well done, very well edited. Again, very well edit, edited, but the the filming and he knew to have young guys who could keep up and and stuff. But uh, I remember they were hunting. It was in Russia, so the Russia guide took them to a further remote place and that was so high up um and the old generation i mean these old guys and even the russian guy said that these people speak in language that he didn't recognize you know they kind of had their and this you know these guys in their 60s and 70s were carrying their their stuff for an amazing shape and yeah. that was one of them, i mean it was an amazing series of that thinking that we that there's still places like that in this world yeah. That Absolutely. It's there's a lot of untapped areas or countries for waterfowl. Like I know there's waterfowl there and I know it's legal, but from a documented standpoint, even just like hunting photography, much less a, like a film, it hasn't been done yet. And so those are some of the places we're really excited to go to and, and try to do more with. That was my next question was uh, what's in the future of this year? Those, and if it's uncharted and you don't want to tell anybody yet, and I can totally understand ah. that well, I mean, travel plan because you got Turkey coming up here soon. Dude. I know, I know. Um, which is tough because we're going to have some of these hunts are going to interfere with Turkey season, which is a problem, sure. but that's the thing with this, with this uh, project It's our waterfowl season is no longer, you know, just November through January. Like, like most people, it's 12 months out of the year to accomplish this project. Um, now that doesn't mean we're hunting every month, but what it means is, is certain parts of the world. And when their hunting seasons are for waterfowl, especially your Southern hemisphere, their seasons don't start till April and they end in August. And so we're kind of going here, there and everywhere all the time. Um, coming up. How about I do this? Cause I'll say, I'll say this. There's, I think by the end of this journey, we'll end up going to 16 or 17 different countries, probably hunt in 15 or 16 different states up and down every flyway. Um, the ones I'm most excited about and one that actually just got, this is the one I was most excited about for season one. And unfortunately, we already ran into our first uh, our first roadblock on the road to 100. Um, and we hit a bump in the road, pun intended, uh, Azerbaijan which is on the border of Armenia and, and Iran. And uh, it was silly, but the government shut down hunting there two weeks before we were supposed to go. It's supposed to be there right now. And they shut it down because the United Nations is holding a uh, climate change <laughs> summit in Baku, the, the, the capital there. And they decided it would be good to shut down all of hunting while that's going on. And so there was literally guys there hunting that were like two days into a hunt and they were like, Nope, you're done. Like, do not even take the gun out tomorrow. You're done. And yeah. so we expect things like that to happen, but Azerbaijan's a unique one. There's species there that I've never seen before. So I was really excited about that one. We're going to try to go back in February, 2025. Um, I've always wanted to go to Pakistan, check that out, see it. Mongolia is definitely high on the list. And those three are, or countries I haven't been to yet. So that's why they're the most intriguing of countries. I'm looking forward to going back to um, Australia is definitely probably top of the list. I love Australia. Um, amazing place. And then South Africa. I mean, I've made it no secret. Africa is my favorite continent period in a story. And so I'm looking forward to getting back to South Africa and hunting the birds over there. I think it's the most underrated wing shooting in the world is South Africa um, because you have everything you have volume hunting for waterfowl, you have very specific niche permit only type of species there. You can hunt decoy pigeon, driven guinea fowl, um, Franklin over some of the most amazing pointers I've ever hunted over before. It's just, it's a wing shooter's paradise. And everybody just thinks Plains game and Cape Buffalo when they go over there. Um, and then species wise, um, the one I'm looking forward to the most is the pygmy goose in South Africa. I don't have that one yet. So the pygmy goose in South Africa, bar-headed goose in uh, um, Mongolia, and then uh, the gargany teal and red-crested poacher in Azerbaijan. Those are the ones that I'm kind of the most anxious for that get me really excited. Um, a lot of this stuff I'm doing for the second or third time, but those are all new for me. So that's that's what gets me excited. Yeah, the pygmy goose would be really cool. And They're awesome. You know, I've never been to Africa and... It, you know, I'm a big game hunter and a waterfowl hunter, and it would be tough for me for my first time because, man, <laughs> I really like to go there and waterfowl hunt to, to, to hunt there. Yeah. You know, well, 
the big my buddy. He's it's just you know, I, it would be it'd be a tough choice for me. It's hard. Well, I and mean, I'll tell you too, like. And planning these trips, you kind of have to, you, you especially Africa, you're never, ever going to do everything in Africa in one trip. I've been over there 13 or 14 trips now, um, planning to go back twice this year. You're never going to get it all done. And I'm not even going to hunt waterfowl this year. I'm just going to do big game stuff, but it's impossible. And so when you go, it's like, man, what is your bucket list for Africa? And if it's both birds and some big game stuff, you're, you're going to be there for two weeks minimum. And so like even this big, we're probably not going to go there for the road to 100 project to film until 2025. And our buddy, uh, Tim, who we hunt with over there for birds, he came into Bozeman. We had a sit down meeting to plan. And at the end of it, to accomplish everything we wanted to do just on the birds, it's going to be at least 14, 15 days with all the travel included to travel to all the different regions to accomplish it. You can't just go to one part of South Africa and do what we have to do. It's like, okay, we've got like a full day of travel in between from one stop to the next in some locations. And then I, I have a few big game species there that I don't have yet. And I was like, well, what if we were to throw these in? And he's like, you're trying to add a whole nother week onto this hunt. You're going to be here for a month. And so I say all that to say it is just such a wealth and game rich environment over in Africa. Like I know a lot of people think that maybe they don't want to do it, but I've never sent a client there in the last 12 years that hasn't gone and then plan their next trip before they left to come back home. It's right. addicting. It's right. flat out addicting. Everyone I've talked to, it's the same thing. Never. I never heard one person say I regret it going. Never, never. <laughs> Brian, I'll tell you what, uh, the road to 100 folks, it, what you need to go check it out. Is there a, a, a website that you have that people can go to? Yes. Yeah. So um, hopefully my website guys are getting close to done, but it's uh, www.road to 100 project.com. Um, if you want to see our film series, and then that's really kind of the bread and butter for what we're doing. It's on YouTube. So you can go to uh, the road to 100 and, and find it there. We've got two episodes available at the time of, of uh, us doing this podcast together. And every other week we're trying to drop a new episode and that'll probably take us through the end of May, beginning of June here of 2024. And so, and we're dropping podcasts kind of in between as we can um, that relate back to those hunts specifically and some of the guys that were there with us. And so um, we, we asked, yes, please go check it out. Let us know what you think. Don't be shy. Drop a comment. Let us know what you like. Um, let us know what you wish you could see more of because again, we want this to be a community project. We consider ourselves investigative journalists on this. We're not, they're pounding our chest about, Oh, look at us. We shot all these cool birds. That's not what it is. It's, we want to showcase the world of waterfowl. We're relying on everybody else to be involved and help us do that and tell us what we need to show you and, and what you would like to see. Uh, that's awesome. That's the same thing we tell our listeners, man, reach out, give us comments all the time. What do you yeah. want to hear more? what would you like to see and folks if any of you are very interested in waterfowl in other countries and other continents man reach out to to ryan and uh because man what a wealth of information it's always good to to you talk to the people who've done it to who've made the mistakes you know before you <laughs> the right way and and ryan i, I man I, I know you're a busy man in fact when we were talking today it's been it's took it's taken some time to get you here because you're trying yeah, sorry about that <laughs> oh no dude it, that's what's i mean that's somebody who's successful and good at what they do man every day is planned out and and, and you're going and but you're sharing that that information you're you're sharing that experience with with the, with our with the people who want to watch it and that's you know, there's a lot of pleasure in that. It's like people ask me today, man. Definitely. How come you don't outfit in this? Man, it's just, you know, I did that when I was younger. It's it's a tough game. And, you know, be honest with you, people, they, they think they deserve to shoot the birds or shoot a big lemon every time because they paid money for it. And, and uh, there's pressure of that. But I said they really don't seem to have the respect. And not all the time, you know, that I think that they should give. And, um Today, you know, I really enjoy taking new kids. I enjoy, mm -hmm. enjoy taking old people who, you know, maybe the kids have left the coop and they used to hunt with their boys. And but I love taking people to share the experience who truly, Definitely. who truly appreciate that. And that's what brings a lot of enjoyment. And doing these podcasts, you know, we we're getting guys from all over that, especially on the instructionals. Man, my kid's watching your podcast. He's learning to run a goose call. <laughs> 
you know, you sit back and it's like, man, it makes me feel good because I really enjoy what I do. This, this, this way of life, I don't call it a sport, you know, sporting events have scores and there's a winner and a loser. And I don't think there's any losers in hunting except, you know, so to me, it's, it's a, it's a way of life and it's Agreed. a way of life. And I truly appreciate your busy day sharing with us and folks, I hope if you enjoy this podcast, man, subscribe, like the button and, and do all that. And it just, uh, it's it's truly an honor to to hear and be able to share other people's life and ex, and experiences. And uh, I also want to give a shout out to our to our sponsors. I want to give Apex Ammo, uh, Domain Outdoors, G Five Broadheads, uh, Prime Bows, Killing Sticks, Lacrosse Footwear, uh, Rite USA, Sika Gear, Stand Releases, and Yeti. Again, Ryan, I want to thank you, brother. Um, I've always had great respect with you, and it's always enjoyed talking with you. And uh, folks out there, remember, be safe, hunt safe, hunt smart, and may the good Lord be your guide. See you on the other side. Well, I'll be out there, rain is shining, all a part of the great design. Bring it on, I can never get enough, because that's what legends are made of.